Welcome to the Top Business Leaders Show, powered by Rise 25 Media. We feature top founders, executives, and business leaders from all over the world. Chad Franzen here, co-host for this show, where we feature top restaurateurs, investors, and business leaders. This is part of our Spot On series. Spot On has the best-in-class payment platform for retail, and they have a flagship solution called Spot On Restaurant, where they combine marketing, software, and payments all in one. They've served everyone from larger chains like Dairy Queen and Subway to small mom-and-pop restaurants. To learn more, go to spoton.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. We help B2B businesses to get ROI, clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships through Done For You podcasts. If you have a B2B to be business and want to build great relationships with clients, referral partners, and thought leaders in your space, there's no better way to do it than through podcasts and content marketing. To learn more, go to rise25media.com or email us at support at rise25media.com. Elena Morris is the CEO, president, and co-founder of Ascent Hospitality Group, a premier hospitality company headquartered in the Northwest. Elena has launched, launched several businesses, local businesses in the hospitality sector, including Wiggleworks Kids and Ascend Hospitality Group, featuring its crown jewel, Ascend Prime, which was recently named one of Architectural Digest's most romantic restaurants in the world. Elena, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? Thank you so much, Chad, for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and your your guests today. It's awesome. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, my pleasure. So tell me a little bit more about Ascend Hospitality Group and uh, what's a part of it. Oh, my goodness. Well, <laughs> in a it's very short life cycle, it has, uh, we have traversed um, a, a, a very interesting footprint. I, whenever I explain this to people, it, it feels like a little bit of a roller coaster ride. So buckle up. Uh, prior to COVID, uh, our company was really, um, we operated in three states, Washington, uh, Oregon, and Utah. And um, we were about $50 million in revenue at 13 restaurants. Post-COVID, we ended up uh, in actually four states. We actually negotiated some deals into Arizona. Um, so we actually expanded our footprint. But as you can imagine, we lost many team members and many, uh, they're like family members. It kind of hurts even to talk about it. We came back at about 350 out of uh, 700 employees, 650 employees. And then um, so I'm proud to say that in 2021, the team really buckled down and we're back to through, you know, rehiring, retraining, expansion. Uh, we closed some of the restaurants that that really just couldn't hang on. And um, we signed some leases, actually six to be exact, um, for expansion of our current brands into new new cities. So uh, we're back to around pre-pandemic um, revenue levels, which, again, we're at 50 million and went to zero, if you can imagine. Oh, I mean, wow. literally zero, zero revenue for about six months. And then through online ordering and and delivery, we went back up to... Uh, about you know 20 25 million and now we're mostly back to where we were um but we now with our new restaurants uh an expansion of our current brands as well as uh, a couple new brands uh we'll be at around a thousand employees going into 2022 oh wow good for you i'm glad i'm glad you guys were able to rebound um i know a lot yeah. of you know it was a it was a struggle for everybody what uh can you tell me some of your brands i, I mentioned ascend right. prime but what what about some of the other ones well, as you know, we're very well known for a Sun Prime Steak and Sushi, which is a 26,000 square foot, uh, 617 seat, five private dining room, four outdoor patio, rooftop restaurant. And it was actually my first restaurant, if you can believe it or not. Uh, that so I don't know what that earns me in the restaurant world, other than like people hug me and they like, they're like, wow, you're still alive. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, I'm also a Famous Dave's franchisee. I'm very proud of that. Uh, Famous Dave's is a 26 year old brand. Uh, Dave Anderson is a personally good friend of mine, and, and he's really still involved and fabulous. Uh, world's Best Barbecue. We uh, do all of our uh, cooking and smoking of our meats on site. And um, I operate Famous Dave's in Washington and Utah. And uh, then we have Stanford's. Stanford's is actually, it, it's a little bit dramatic, actually. Uh, as many of your listeners probably know, uh, Stanford's was part of Restaurants Unlimited. Restaurants Unlimited was probably one of the larger uh, hospitality companies in the Pacific Northwest. And at the end of 2019, um, they filed bankruptcy and um, 
they decided to sell. So they didn't go into protection. Um, the folks at Landry's sort of gobbled everybody up and then went out to uh, to sale on some of the brands. And we chose, because we're in the state, we are in the beef business. <laughs> um, we we chose to acquire uh, Stanford's and uh, they have operations in Washington and Oregon. And now we're expanding that into Utah. So I'm super excited to have that brand there. Again, they started, you know, over, gosh, you know, 20 years ago uh, by a company called Pacific Coast Restaurants in Oregon. One of the most kind of beloved hospitality companies in the Pacific Northwest from a, you know, a generational standpoint. So uh, those are our brands. We did have a food hall. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, we, we just could not survive. We had to close the food hall. Uh, it, it's not, you know, gathering places like that are just not going to make it. <laughs> Many of them are just not going to make it if they, if they can't do um, an extensive amount of delivery and to go. Um, and then we're, uh, we're expanding our footprint this year into Tempe, Arizona, where we have acquired a space that used to house two nightclubs. And uh, we're bringing up sort of like a his and hers nightclub environment. So I'm pretty excited about that as well as re we renovated and evolved. Well, actually we evolved Stanford's um, and made Stanford steak in downtown Tacoma this year. Uh, it is the new version of Stanford's. And then we are gonna do an additional steak and sushi version of Stanford's uh, in Salt Lake City uh, that will open in May. And then our next footprint for Famous Days will be actually the very first quick serve Famous Days, so drive-through uh, Famous Days and the entire brand. And that'll open in Salt Lake City as well. Okay. Wow. That's that's great. So you, you said uh, Ascend Prime was your first one, right? Yeah. Tell me a little right. bit about how that came about. I mean, the, like your background right now, for those who are watching on video, obviously it looks like a, yeah. a like an incredible atmosphere. Just kind of tell me about uh, how that came about and what, what got you into it. Sure. Well, it was a... Um, it was a labor of love, partnership, um, extraordinary trust, and... Um, a leap of faith really by a, a lot of people. Um, I started Ascend Hospitality Group with my partners. Uh, and at this point, one of my partners, Jeffrey Frederick, uh, who I worked with, at, I, I, I got into the restaurant. I'm an engineer. I'm a software engineer. That's actually, I have an MBA in technology. <laughs> wow. Believe it or not. <laughs> um, and I spent uh, 17 years as an SAP consultant actually doing systems integration. Um, but I've always been, you know, in sales and, and I've had businesses on the side and I, I'm really a true people and hospitality person. So, um, when I, when I had the opportunity to go into famous days of America, which is how I got into the restaurant business. Um, I met my current partner who is uh, Jeffrey Frederick, who came out of Caesars and has an extensive amount of experience concepting, developing, designing, um, and operating restaurants on behalf of. Uh, celebrity chefs and things of that nature. So his background is, um, you know, launching, contacting, developing, designing, and launching and operating celebrity chef restaurants like Giada, all the Gordon Ramsay restaurants in Vegas, uh, Guy Fieri, and and um, then just being in charge of all of the food and beverage at Caesars. And so he did that for a pretty long time, and then spun himself off as his own his own company. Um, he when when we I live in downtown Bellevue, and so when we um, got the call that this building was being built. It's uh, Lincoln Square South. It's kind of on the opposite side of where Bellevue Square Mall, which is a, a huge regional retail center uh, owned by uh, Kemper Freeman and uh, uh, Kemper Development Company. They built this building and it was a billion dollar investment. It's a 31 stories. It's pretty incredible. And it houses tech companies like um, Nintendo US, the Balmer Group. Um, uh, Valve Software, you know, <laughs> they make Steam, like all of these uh -huh. amazing tech companies. And um, I knew that, you know, there needed to be a fair amount of food, uh, you know, conglomeration in this building. And so we actually did our food hall and ascend in the same building. Just one was on the second floor, one was on the 31st floor. Mm -hmm. So uh, we went to Jeffrey and said, hey, listen, you know, do you, we have the opportunity to take out this rooftop restaurant. And um, what do you think? Because they want to make it into another restaurant, which, you know, whatever. It's good they didn't do that. <laughs> that restaurant company went bankrupt. Oh, so, wow. yeah. Um, and so we said, OK, let's let's submit something that feels more like putting Bellevue in as the twin to 
Seattle. So I'm going to like lean to the, let me lean to the right here. The space needle is over there. Right there. Nice. So you can see the space needle and then you can see our building. And so just look across like Washington and we wanted that sort of twin city feel. And when we submitted the restaurant design, uh, and again, it's th- it's 360 degrees of unobstructed views. That's the way the architect should be. They should win an architecture award, quite frankly, because this building is phenomenally amazing. And so our only <coughs> job is just don't screw the view up. <laughs> like, that's it. And so all the restaurant concepts develop or concepts that they had been, uh, which a Kemper Development Company had been uh, proposed were all like they had the kitchens slammed up against one side of the um, of the uh, window. You know, so essentially any restaurant proposal they received, it was obstructing one of the views. And we were like, what are you guys doing? So we put the kitchen in the interstitial and uh, it, the, the building is such that it is a big U, right? or sorry, it is a big circle. Mm-hmm. And then in the, in the center, there are the elevator shafts, which was the right thing to do. They didn't put them up against the glass. It was a harder construction, but it made for a better, more premium environment. And so mm-hmm. the restaurant really is, I mean, 360 degrees, you can walk around. It's either private dining, uh, outdoor patio, main dining room, or we have a 5,000 square foot sushi lounge, as well as a lounge with fireplaces, right? And so you can, I mean, the views of like the Olympics and the, you know, and the, um, you can see Mount Rainier, right? Like, I mean, like in May, in the Cascade, like you can see Mount Baker, like it's, unbelievable so that's that's kind of how we we want we want on innovation right i mean we want on common sense and innovation and of course the cast of characters that we brought to to open the restaurant um i mean this is like an all-star cast of chefs and general managers and there it felt very celebrity um and so uh it feels very cosmopolitan cosmopolitan probably the number one the number one um comment I get is thank you for bringing a little bit of New York, Chicago, and LA to Bellevue, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> yeah, nice. So what would you say is the best minute of the day to be there considering all the view, you know, where the sun might be and things like that? What would you right say here. is the best hour of the day? Twilight. So it okay. depends on, you know, we live in the Pacific Northwest, so our our summer days are long, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> and our winter days are very short. So twilight is, it could be anywhere from 445 to nine o'clock, right? So it just depends what I, I would just tell anybody visiting, look at, look at the, look at the uh, forecast, look for twilight, just because it's a little bit foggy doesn't mean it's not going to be foggy up top, right? Because we're actually above the clouds sometimes, believe it or not. Um, wow. and so, yeah. So I would say uh, definitely shoot for twilight. So, so that was your first your first restaurant, but it was you had already started Ascend Hospitality Group, correct? Yeah, I did because we were in planning. We 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 did a lot of things simultaneously. One of the things that I recognized about hospitality, I'd been working in the restaurant industry for a year and a half prior to opening uh, Ascend Prime Steak and Sushi, um, is is that unless you are a chef or you have grown up in the hospitality industry and you want like your neighborhood bar and restaurant, like that's where you want to work and that's what you want to do. And you're just doing it for you, right? Like really, um, if your intention is not to work in your restaurant, you need to have a lot of restaurants. Right? <laughs> it's just, it economies of scale just don't work anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. It's very difficult to have, um, want a one Z two Z kind of environment. I, I know because I've talked to, I'm friends with, I mean, there's almost no restaurant where I don't know I'm not friends with up here. It's a very tiny community. Mm-hmm. We all sort of try and help each other out. It's really hard. I could probably have two ascends, right? But it's a $15 million restaurant, right? So it's not real. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's it's uh it's kind of difficult. But I did a lot of the stuff at the same time. So I became a famous Dave's franchisee at the same time that I signed the lease for uh ascend. Uh, prime steak and sushi and also the food hall and so we actually opened the food hall two months after we became a famous Davis franchisee and we opened a Sun prime steak and sushi six months after we uh became a famous Davis franchisee so it was like boom 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 right and okay uh, it's uh it's difficult so you you're working as a as you know in, kind of in engineering and things like that what attracted you to a becoming a franchisee and then moving forward into all this 
Yeah. Well, uh, you know, our background, um, I will, I will just say this. My background is high tech, as I mentioned. Um, and in the high tech space, I actually worked for two fortune 500 companies and, um, worked on a very significant piece of software. And I, I, I basically came up through Lucent Technologies, right? And so you don't hear that name very much anymore. But for those of us who kind of grew up in the late, late 90s, mm-hmm. um, you know, you got your your start, basically AT&T. If you didn't get your start in at and I, I don't think I've met anybody in tech today that didn't get their start in at and <laughs> But um but anyway, so the, I think the point is, though, I worked on a merger and acquisition that was pretty high profile with a private equity company. And um, I uh, I think I, I was pretty young and I, I sort of found my I sort of found my calling. Right. I, I managed a very large group of engineers um, and it, we created something very cool that ended up being worth a lot of money. And uh, it was so cool, in fact, that I got laid off after the merger. <laughs> like everybody, right? Um, and uh, it was, it was, but it, it taught me, you know, sort of like the, 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 I guess the ebb and flow of the the cap markets. And I was like, all right, well, what am I going to do now? And how do I, you know, whatever. I, I sort of came out of tech and and started to start. I started my family, mm-hmm. and um, I lived in the Pacific Northwest, and there really were no indoor kids playgrounds at all, and it rains literally all the time here. So it's like, come on guys, right? This was 2008. Um, and so I started uh, Wiggle Works Kids, which was an indoor kids playground business um, that I actually created a franchise for, but I didn't sell franchises fast enough. So I just got copied. Um, and at the end of the day, while I'm an entrepreneur, I'm, I, I'm a restaurateur, I'm an entrepreneur. Like I'm an entrepreneur first. I've yeah. had multiple businesses. Um, I, I lost a million dollars. It, it was the worst decision I've ever made. It was the best decision and worst decision I've ever made. And, and truthfully, um, and, and I'm not just talking, it wasn't bank money. It was, it was my money. <laughs> so it was like, and, and, and so I think what it taught me is the, just the hard knocks of the ebbs and flows and roller coaster ride of being an entrepreneur. And so, but I, but I ran it for 10 years almost. Right. I mean, I didn't sell Wiggle Works until 2019, 2020, I think is, is mm-hmm. the end of 2020 finally, or sorry, the end of 2019, I, I finally sold it. Um, and I sold it for literally nothing. I sold it for like the cost of assets, <laughs> like, oh, really? the valuation, not the cost, but the value of the assets. Um, but, it, but having said all of that, I think that, you know, at that point, uh, I was involved with some private equity firms and doing some various consulting around various things. And um, some of it was restructure. Some of it was M&A. Some of it was uh, was um, tech. You know, I'm like a floating chief technology officer for some firms. And um, and uh, they asked me to go in and, and help restructure Famous Days. And that is ultimately how I got started in the restaurant business. It was not because I'm a restaurateur. Mm. It was because I'm an entrepreneur and I do things like look at stuff and go like, why should we pay for that? Right. And just, you know, the accountability and it, it was a company that had rotated itself through, and you can go read about the tail of the tape at Famous Days, but prior to 2015, I mean, they had been through like 10 CEOs and there were, there are still such amazing people there. I mean, it is a restaurant business that's based on uh, heart and life skills. And, you know, Dave always says, um, serve a guest or serve someone who is, right? And so is that bottom-up mentality of like, there's no such thing as corporate. Your job is to serve operate at the pleasure of operations because that's who's interacting with our guests. So we need to do whatever we need to do to make their jobs easier. And, and, and I really appreciated that more than anything, just being in the hospitality business previously. I mean, it served families with young children. I mean, this was a high volume environment. I just didn't have a price right. Um, and so I lost my, I lost my fortune, but, but, you know, I served families of kids under five, right? There's no more, you know, there's no more heart you can give to people other than that family, right. Or those mm-hmm. single moms and single dads and things of that nature. So, um, so anyway, as, as I got into, you know, being on site at, at famous saves for a year and a half, I, um, I helped to turn the company around and that's kind of the, it was sort of the start of all of that. And, uh, I stayed there for about a year and a half and, 
Um, I, I would never wanted to be the CEO. That was not my goal. Like I, once I was there and realized like what restaurant industry I was about, I was like, yeah, it's time for me to start my own restaurant business. And, and, and there was real estate opportunity. This was one of them. Sure. So that's, that's kind of how that all happened. So did you, so, you know, you, you mentioned that you had, you had wiggle works, which ended up, you know, you, you loved it, but it ended up not being a lucrative uh, opportunity. Mm-hmm. What did you learn from that that helped you? kind of, you know, with your success at Famous Dave's? Oh my gosh. It, one big thing. It's like, you got to strike while the iron's hot. You know what I mean? I had a kick butt concept. It, it was kick butt. I just didn't move fast enough. I literally did not move fast. It was like analysis paralysis. Not, I, I guess, and this is what, when I coach, I coach a lot of women, uh, women entrepreneurs, women in business, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's like that, but anybody could benefit from this advice, which is, you know, you just have to believe in your freaking self, right? Like stop looking around and trying to get validation. It's like when your gut tells you, you got to do it and you have to believe in yourself enough that like 80% of the time you're probably going to be right. And the 20% of the time you're not, you just have to tap and you're going to know you're going to be right. You know, it's a 50, 50 um, mm-hmm. after that. I, you have to move. You can't dither because the market isn't going to wait for you. Um, I already knew all the people stuff. I already knew how to create a business. I already knew how to manage the administrative side. I know I know how to run executive teams. I know how to get results. I'm a salesperson after all. I mean, that is my background. Um, I'm at the end of the day, a salesperson. Um, but but that all of those things I already had. What I didn't know was how to manipulate essentially the the economies of scale in the economy and to move with the cap markets. Like it just, it, it didn't dawn on me at the time I was young. I was really young and I was a new mom, really to be honest. I mean, I opened my very first Wiggle Works uh, with my daughter on in a baby Bjorn. I was at the register and she was five months old. Oh, wow. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Have you, um, you, you talked about uh, kind of the, the philosophy of famous Dave's that kind of that servant leadership style. Have you kind of uh, incorporated that into the other brands that you're, you're associated with at Ascend? Oh yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. I, you know, I don't, we are, our core values of our business at this point, um, which have now been they're in everything we do it is our measuring stick. Um, we do our, all of our um, reviews and it, it is just like it is our accountability tool, but it's you matter, team matters, and service matters. And that's it, right? And then if people can't get that right, I generally will say to them, if I would do it, you should do it. And if I wouldn't do it, then please don't do it, right? Like that, <laughs> that's that mm-hmm. simple. It really is easy to work here. Um, but we invite people to, uh, we, we, we will promote them to guests very, very quickly if they are not here to serve because it is a very difficult situation. We work when everyone else is is celebrating and uh that can be very demoralizing but you have to really enjoy celebrating with others um, and for others and helping others celebrate and make them feel very special in order to do this job every day so yeah how do you determine which um investments are good ones to add to your group well it's our investor always says one thing a bad deal never gets better Okay. And you can apply that to literally any industry that you're in, but you cannot recover from two things in this business, a bad real estate deal and then bad deals in general. So like if you have to make a lot of deals when you're starting a restaurant, right? And the very first thing you have to decide is, is this piece of real estate an A, B or a C? Because if the brand that you put into a piece of real estate isn't, doesn't serve the community the way that you hoped, or it doesn't work, or whatever the case may be, you got to be ready to like churn because these uh, leases, um, we own very little of our real estate uh, just because it wasn't the market when we got into it. Now it's a little easier to do if you have pad sites and things. Mm-hmm. But um, these leases are, you know, 10 year leases, two, five year uh, extensions and things. I mean, they're a lot, like I'm going to be 70 years old, you know? <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to be in Boca, like, you know, at Leisure World when I'm 75. I'm not trying to be like dealing with this place. But, but I think my point, you know, my point is uh, you, you got to make, you got to make good deals. You, you just can't, you know, the best 
frigging concept in the world, but if you're running an 11% occupancy cost, you're never going to make it, right? Um, the, the second big thing is um, where you have your restaurant, right? Where you, where you have your, I mean, everybody should know this, right? Like you can't start a business depending on what you do, unless you're in the, you know, unless you're in the, the products, the CPG space, um, but if you're in a service-based business, you better be someone that has like some friendly labor, right? And that is a lesson that has been really difficult <clears throat> because I'm in the Pacific Northwest and from a labor perspective, um, not just, I'm, I'm not even talking about labor regulation. I'm just talking about rates, you know, like uh, the average rate for a dishwasher, the average rate for, you know, et cetera. It's expensive to live here. And so um, for people to actually be able to live you know, we, we have to, we have to do something. I'm the highest labor market in the United States almost. Right. And so when you have landlords who owe the banks, right. And their the interest rates are going up and, you know, you have all of these, they're having to refinance and do all these things. And, you know, they're having, their tenants are having a tough time paying. And then I've got, so, so then my costs are starting to rise because cams go up. So then I have that and my labor rate, I mean, these, taxpayers just voted in these three or four different labor hikes over the last, you know, four years. And I mean, it is, it is, we've had to get very creative about pricing so that we can, um, we can survive. I mean, we, we have to pay people. Uh, we have to abide by the law. We need people to make a good living. Um, and yes, people are still getting tips, but at the end of the day, that's just not enough anymore because people, you know, hospitality workers, which ironically, the hospitality industry is the second largest employer in the United States. <clears throat> hospitality workers, they're just no longer working two and three jobs, right? It's just, it's untenable. It's untenable in the market. You can't do it. So uh, we've had to make that up. So labor is going up astronomically. And then on top of it, I mean, you guys all know what's happening with our food costs. Like our food costs are out of control and has nothing to do with anything other the cost of trucking, the cost of storage, the cost of cutting right? Like any sort of product that has to be harvested and then cut to a specific spec. So beef, pork, and chicken. Um, and then on top of that, uh, produce, right? Because the labor for the workers to go pick the produce and then you got to get the produce. And then by the time you get it, it's delayed because it's been sitting in a past somewhere. And so now it's rotten. Like the cost of labor for production of food is out of control. And so between um, food costs or sorry, between labor costs for our producers and then shipping, it's almost impossible. So you, you really do have to say, I'm going to limit my menu. I'm going to take certain skews off my menu because I just, it's that one off. Like we serve beef, 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 pork, chicken, mm -hmm. scallops. <laughs> right. It's like, bye. Right. Um, so, so we had to look at that. And we also had to look at um, the cost of labor and labor opportunities and doing things like flexing manager work weeks. And maybe we have more managers and maybe they go to hourly because it's actually better than for them, but it's also better for us because then they can make overtime, but then we're not on the hook for, you know, having to guarantee certain schedule. Like there's all kinds of stuff that we've had to look at to say like maybe we reformulate our business within the confines of the law um but that gives people a better quality of life and then also allows us to i mean certainly we've had to raise our prices you know we've absolutely had to raise our prices uh just like everyone else and we've had to change the format of our restaurants like one of our restaurants we shut down for dine-in completely i'm like but you know if you look at the labor that's associated with our dine-in business and the labor that's associated with to go deliver and catering Mm -hmm. And by the way, the revenue is 60-40. So it's 60% outside of the four walls and 40% inside of the four walls, if you look at the revenue. But the 40% inside of the four walls of dine-in is taking up 70% of your labor. by Right now, all oh, of a sudden, yeah. during, you know, so we've had to do stuff like that. And it's uh, it's a very difficult environment to operate in. And if you do not have big economies of scale, I just don't know how people are doing it. Sure, sure. Is there... Uh... What do you, what would you say are some of the things that you're most proud of as, as your time, you know, kind of being in charge there at Ascend? Yeah. People are people. I mean, it's like the number their flexibility, their, uh, their wherewithal, their, 
you know, ability to adapt and if they're fearless attitude, right? I mean, it's, it's that stick to of a family. That's like, I mean, one day we were in business and having the best quarter of our life, February of 2019. And literally 30 days later, I had to lay off 550 people and it was horrible, right? It was absolutely a disaster. And, and the, those who were left sort of got like famous Dave is a really good example of these guys. They do a lot of their business outside of the four walls. So we didn't actually have to lay as many people off at famous Dave's and um, they just cranked out to go into delivery. And um, during the pandemic, and that actually helped to pay for healthcare for the entire company. Right. So it's, it's the, it's making people aware that they have an impact no matter how little they think they do. And, um, as long as I do my job of communicating and make, again, you matter, team matters, service matters. If I do that job, then, um, they will, they will do what they always do, which is rise to the occasion and take care of each other and take care of our guests. When, when people feel well cared for, they will take care of each other and guests. If they don't, you know, you go into a restaurant and you have a crappy experience, you have nobody to blame but the owner, right? Like really, or the management team, because that's just the people feeling not well cared for. It really does. And it works like that in relationships. So um, I'm the most proud of, of my people more than anything. Is there is there something you have to do like daily or, or remind yourself or maintain a mentality in order to, you know, have such a positive attitude and lead people in that way? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, I love what I do, right? I, I really do. I mean, I love restaurants are, are not complex. There's just a lot of moving parts in it. You know, you get around a lot of people who oversimplify it and it it's fresh. It's probably the most frustrating thing. Um, I have to remind myself that not everybody has access to the information I do. And so people are frustrated, confused, concerned, whatever. My job is to communicate. You know, my job is to motivate, inspire, lead, provide vision and communicate and take care of our people. I mean, that, that is like the number one job of the chief executive, right? It's people, process, performance, period, right? End of story. And, um, and so I think what I, my daily mantra is just to remind myself that, that it's a big company and that it should not get caught in the quagmire of red tape. That's why I'm an entrepreneur. That's why I'm not, you know, I, I'm not trying to make this into anything other than that. And that um, I've asked these people to come along this journey with me and they deserve uh, transparency and they deserve communication. And when people, again, I have to look at my leaders and when they feel well cared for, they take care of their people and, and so on and so forth. And so I would say that's probably the daily mantra. Um, when I'm frustrated is because I either have the right person in the wrong seat, the wrong person, and I got to make a hard decision or, um, I've given poor direction and maybe I'm, you know, not, not providing the best leadership that I possibly could. And there's just really nowhere else to look, but into the mirror. It's good to gaze into the mirror when you're a leader. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Hey, uh, it's been great talking to you. I have one one more question right. for you. Um, but first, how can people learn more about uh, Ascend Hospitality Group and its properties? Absolutely. Um, we'd love to invite everybody to go to ascendhg.com and you can see certainly all of the good uh, stuff that we're doing, all of our brands. But the number one thing that you'll see is, um, is something called AHG Cares. Uh, our, our company is truly based on a philosophy of servant, as, as we've talked a little bit about today, servant leadership, but mostly service. And we serve uh, the communities that so greatly support us. Uh, we do a lot of philanthropy. We do a lot of, um, of uh, active work with our communities in the schools. In particular, that's kind of my lane um, is education and particularly culinary and service education, things of that nature. Um, and you'll see all of the things we do with all of the uh, uh, all of the folks in our communities that also want to give back. And so we'd love for people to learn more about AHG Cares and, and all that we're doing for our communities. I think uh, when you spread spread the good work, the good work comes back to you. And so uh, it's a little bit of pay it forward what we do. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, my last question for you. Are there any books or podcasts that you have found particularly valuable or, or enjoyable as you're kind of in your leadership process? <laughs> well, let's see here. Um, 
I am really tight with a lot of our local folk, right? And so we have actually, you know, there's not a national podcast that I really listen to. Um, the books that I read are really uh, more, you know, business process oriented mm-hmm. and really a bore. I think for a lot of people, I spend my time in like design books and things like that because we're, we're opening uh, new restaurants. But um, I would say I'm kind of looking up at my thing here, probably like the number one book I look at on a daily basis is uh, The Greatest Salesman in the World by Ogmandino. That's probably like, you know, like just that daily reminder that uh, we are worthy, we are good enough, um, and that um, we can, if you believe it, you can achieve it kind of thing. I think mm-hmm. that that is something that that I subscribe to on a daily basis. And then, um, you know, there are a couple of really awesome podcasts about like going behind the scenes in business. Um, one of them was just featured on the daily show and I forget the guy's name and I'm sorry for that, but but it, I would say when people can, can look into trying to understand how things work behind the scenes, it gives you a greater uh, amount of empathy and understanding. And, and I think that's always, that's always best. And then of course my girl, Heather McMahon, I love comedy. Heather McMahon is a good friend of mine and uh, she has the absolutely not podcast. I think, Everybody needs a little bit more levity in their life. <laughs> sure. um, and she is hilarious. So she com- she's a, a comic. She lives in Atlanta. Um, she's visited my restaurant. She's absolutely hilarious. And I would say if you need a good bit of levity, please go listen to the Absolutely Not podcast. My girl, Heather McMahon. All right. Hey, uh, Elena, it's been great. It's been great to talk to you. It's been fun hearing your stories and your experiences and all about uh, Ascend. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Chad. Really appreciate it. So long, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Top Business Leaders Show, powered by Rise25. Visit rise25.com to check out more episodes of the show and to learn more about how you can start your own podcast.